right, awesome. Great. All right. All right. Hey, everyone. Thanks for coming. I'm going to be speaking about demand side tokenomics. It's a, a school of thought within tokenomics. And I'm going to be talking about how to use demand side tokenomics to make your protocol useful, valuable, and secure, and the token as well. My name is Nate. I've been writing at Eat Sleep Crypto since 2017 on token valuation and tokenomics. So the first thing I want to start off with is this meme right here. I'm going to give you guys a second to take it in just to um, get the gist of what we're going for. This is basically 90% of projects that I see when, when they talk about tokenomics, they're talking about these things. And so I want to start by explaining what tokenomics is. So in short, tokenomics describe how a token's use affect its price. And tokenomics is made up of two words, token and economics, where economics is made up of supply and demand. And so it's surprising to me, but something that I want to point out in the highlight of my talk is that demand is actually uh, much more important than supply in your tokenomics. And so people are focused on supply allocation and distribution a lot of the time. So that looks like what their emissions curve is or how many tokens go to investors versus to the community and how they're getting those tokens there. These are important considerations, but they're actually secondary. The, the primary thing that you should be focused on when you're designing a protocol and building a token is the demand for that token to be used in the protocol, which is going to drive the price by creating necessary demand for your token on the markets. And you can't just rely on speculation for that kind of demand. It has to come from the utility of the token in the protocol. And that's what I'll be talking about today. So demand side tokenomics is made up of three principles. These are the principles of tokenomics. And if you meet these principles, your token will necessarily be valuable. Your protocol will be valuable. And it will be secure and able to sustain itself for the long term. And those are utility which is the value created by your protocol for users, value capture, which is the, the amount of value that you're able to, uh, it's analogous to profit in a business, so it's the amount of value you're able to accrue the token to the token or distribute out to holders, and economic security, which is distinct from technical security, and I'll get into that in a bit. But good tokenomics follow these three principles without fail. So the first principle is utility. And the, the first point of that that I want to make is that you should be solving large problems. And these problems, like you want a large total addressable market. So the, the number of users that you're able to serve and the amount, the degree to which you're able to serve them should be a, a primary focus when you're looking at this principle of utility and maximizing that for your tokenomics. And to do that, the best thing, the best thing to consider and keep in mind when you're designing your utility is using blockchain's unique properties. And so you know, blockchains, as we all know, have distinct properties that are completely different than the, um, that enable completely different applications than the kinds of things we see in Web2 or in traditional finance. And you want to use those properties. So as an example, permissionlessness is a, is a quality of a blockchain that you're not going to find, or a smart contract that you're not going to find in Web2 in TradFi. Uh, credible neutrality, another one. So, um, and censorship resistance. So if, if you have these kinds of properties, then you can know that your token and your protocol, or your, at least your protocol, is going to have some utility, unique utility to users. And that creates a unique value proposition. So another point is when you're designing for utility, you want to identify the reasons that your users want to use your protocol. And that's going to help you find synchronicities in groups of users that might also be able to be included in your protocol to give it additional utility and additional value capture, as we'll talk about in a moment. But one example that I want to talk about uh, that does this really well was the original MakerDAO design. So Maker essentially matched up DGEN's demand for leverage with more conservative investors' demand for stable coins. And in this graph over here, on the right, those two groups are represented by borrowers and die holders. The other three groups are what I call mercenary users. They're like just there for the money. They're purely there because they're trying to get yields. And they also serve a, an important purpose in the protocol. And so breaking down the motivations of your users is going to help you design for utility. 
And Maker is one example of a protocol that does this well. The second principle of tokenomics is value capture. So the, the first principle is concerned with value creation. This is value capture. So it's the amount of um, value that you're able to accrue to your token and either distribute that out or um, accrete it to the token and have the token price go up. And you do this through the strategic inclusion of tokenomic mechanisms, which are ways your token is used in the protocol to give it fundamental demand and capture this value. And so those ways are going to loosely correspond to three asset classes from traditional finance. Those are currencies, commodities, and equities. So your token could be currency-like, commodity-like, or equity-like. That's going to be like a, a medium of exchange, or a utility token, or uh, a token that's paying dividends of some kind. And they're not mutually exclusive. In fact, the best tokens have properties of all three of these asset classes and work similarly. So digging a little bit more into tokenomic mechanisms, I want to use Synthetics protocol as an example. Um, so Synthetics is a synthetic derivatives platform. The um, token SNX is used to collateralize synthetic assets, which makes the demand for SNX tokens proportional to the demand for uh, the collateralized assets that are, that are on-chain in a way that... Um, you know, that are available to users in, in a way that's exclusive to the Synthetix protocol. So there is some essential demand for SNX tokens. And uh, that collateralization is an example of a demand side mechanism because you're magnifying the demand for your token based on the, use, uh, the utility in your protocol or your token utility, the, the utility of your token inside of that protocol. Um, similarly, a staking SNX locks up supply. That's a supply side mechanism. It's not a demand side mechanism because the demand is not fundamentally, the synthetics protocol, the demand we would hope is not fundamentally for yields. Yields you can find in a lot of different places, but the essential utility of synthetics and what drives its token value is the collateralization mechanism. So staking is a supply side mechanism. Um, and to, I, I want to underscore that because to make that mistake, you, if you make that mistake of thinking yields are the fundamental product of your protocol, your head's going to be in the wrong place. You're going to design things that are not sustainable and lead to collapse. And so the third principle deals with that. That's economic security. And so this is distinct from technical security in that technical security is like a lack of bugs in the code and may, means the code can't be used um, you know, maliciously. Economic security is a lack of bugs in the system design or in the incentives in the game theory. And uh, a few examples of this, because this is probably an, a newer concept to a lot of people. MEV is an example of a, a system that's not explicitly designed to do what it does. It's, it's being taken advantage of, and that can, that can hurt users in the long run. So that's MEV is, is an economic security vulnerability in a sense. Um, Oracle manipulation, like we saw with the prices of assets on Aave and Mango Markets last year, is another example of an economic security exploit where the, the code was followed to a T, but the, uh, the economics and the game theory and the design was manipulated to uh, hurt a group of users. And the third example is death spirals, as we saw with the uh, price of Terra of Luna um, last year. So that's an example of an exploit. An externality is like a, um, an unintended consequence. So borrowing this term from economics, an unintended consequence to a group of users um, that, uh, that were not um, intentionally like paying for that consequence or not responsible for that consequence. So uh, an externality to the token price um, would be like step N, where they had a, a large amount of supply they were using to incentivize users to participate in the protocol, but they weren't matching that demand or that supply with any demand. Um, so that's an example of, of an externality that you can end up with if you're not considering economic security as you're designing your protocol. So it also includes game theory, the um, sets of incentives that you're using to get users to take certain actions. And um, I put this word coopetition up there because I came across it as I was uh, preparing for this talk. Coopetition is the macro alignment of incentives with micro incentives, um, where micro incentives might be uh, between users who are competing 
for various things. So a perfect example of that is like mining. Miners are all securing the protocol, but individually they're trying to maximize their own profit. And so the, um, a big point that I want to talk about here is that there are trade-offs between each of these three principles, and you have to consider this when you're designing. And the, um, so an example, there is a trade-off between utility and value capture, just like there's a trade-off between the value to consumers of a product or a, or a service and the profit of a business. And you have to balance these two things. Um, Another, another example, value capture has a trade-off with economic security. If you capture too much value by making your asset, say, uh, a collateral, um, the base collateral token for another token in your protocol that has a lot of demand, like Terra did, then you risk collapse um, through an economic security vulnerability because you went too far on the value capture and not far enough in the economic security. So I have a few logos up here on the left. That's Terra. Luna, they were, you know, what I just described, they had utility and value capture, but they didn't have economic security. They hadn't, they hadn't maximized uh, the aggregate of these three. On the bottom, you've got Uniswap, which is very useful and ha is secure, but doesn't capture very much value at all. And it's really difficult for Uniswap to capture value now because they've baked in their uh, utility and value capture in their... Uh, non-upgradable contracts. Um, side note, I definitely recommend not having upgradable contracts, but that makes it all the more important to design utility and value capture in from the beginning. You can't just capture value later. And that third on the right there is iExec. They're a marketplace for distributed computing, and I'm betting you probably haven't heard of them because they address a very small target market. And so they, they didn't maximize the utility of their protocol, or maybe they maximized their protocol's utility, but they're working in a space that's not that valuable. It's not that big of a total addressable market. And so they're somewhat lacking in utility, even though they have value capture and economic security. And you have to have all three of these things to make sure your token is as valuable as possible, is, is fundamentally valuable. And um, you can do that by maximizing the aggregate of those three. So the takeaways that I want to leave you with here are it's extremely important to focus on demand before you decrease supply. Any supply side mechanisms or any reductions in supply are only going to magnify the value of your token if there's some value to magnify. Like it, that, and that value can't just come from speculation. You have to have some real reason for, um, for users to buy your token. And that's going to give you sustained demand over time. So that's going to bring the price of your token up. And it's going to keep it afloat in bear markets. It's going to keep you funded. I mean, there, there are all these second order effects of, the, um, of focusing on demand first. And so that's, that's what I want to relay to you today. And um, the, the goal of designing tokenomics should be to maximize the aggregate of these three principles. Because as I mentioned, there are trade-offs um, between utility, value capture, and economic security. And you can do that through the demand side tokenomics framework. So um, that is my talk. And uh, if you are interested in learning more about this or uh, would like help with your tokenomics and designing things, I consult for decentralized protocols, and I would love to help you think through some of the trade-offs of these things and how to maximize your token value and token price. Um, you can find me around the conference, the rest of ETH Denver, and uh, I'm looking forward to talking with, with a bunch of you. Thank you so much.